talking to us about traditionalism versus commercialism in collecting folklore. And so I will turn it over to you. Oh, it's not so much collecting folklore as it is just what's happened down in my part of the state, which is the Ozarks, which has gone from isolationism to a wild tourism gone berserk, just about as what it is. <clears throat> now, I'm going to kind of read this, because if I try to do this and look up and look down, I lose my place, and then Kathy and I were talking, we both spend 15 minutes figuring out where we left off, so it's going to kind of halfway read and halfway extemporaneous. First, this is not going to be what you call an academic presentation. It's going to be a very brief look at some of the dramatic changes I've observed over the years, especially the last 35, in the southwest Missouri and northwest Arkansas Ozarks. My only qualification, the only credential I have, is simply a matter of osmosis. I've lived there all my life so far, and I'm old enough now to start making some comparisons. Nowhere I'm going to have to kind of set a scene, because this is my first time in North Missouri. A lot of you have never been to South Missouri, so you kind of got to know where we come from on this. Nowhere else in the geographic boundaries of the Ozarks have these changes been more evident and pronounced than in Stone and Taney counties in Missouri, that's south of Springfield. That'd be your Branson, Silver Dollar City, Shepherd the Hills Farm, and the Table Rock Dam area. And in the Washington, Benton, and Carroll County sections of Arkansas, which would be Fayetteville, and Springdale, and Rogers, Eureka Springs. And you'd have to jump over then to Boone and Baxter County, which would be Mountain Home. And I guess you could jump, jump down and include Mountain View, which would be Stone County. That's where the tourists have really come. <clears throat> uh, this region was settled predominantly by Scotch-Irish, mostly from Tennessee. <clears throat> and I read one time that up to the 50s, and this may or may not be true, but it was in print, so I'm sure it is. Over 80% of the inhabitants in these areas I'm going to talk about were descendants of Tennesseans. And I believe that because my family, for six generations back, came from the first Tennesseans or, or North Carolinians, some of them. After the Civil War, large numbers of Germans came, but they settled in the towns or in the small prairies interspersed throughout the hills. They weren't interested in growing rocks. <clears throat> by the 1880s, the chaos left by the war was beginning to subside, and with the exception of the timber industry and the tri-state mining over around Joplin, it remained an agrarian and a very clannish society. The people settled into pretty much a status quo life and enjoyed their isolation from the mainstream of America. One writer described them as the most deliberately unprogressive people in the United States. <laughs> this was interrupted somewhat by World War I, but in the post-World War II period, things really began to change. New residents began moving in, and they're still coming in by the droves. For the past 20 years or so, the counties I'm talking about have consistently been among the fastest growing in the United States. It's not, an all, it's not at all unusual to hear an eastern or a northern accent in even the most remote parts of the hills. It's interesting that many of the newcomers have maintained their ways and the natives theirs. They're kind of like oil and water. They're in the same space, but they don't mix. It's interesting to talk about the changes that have occurred to these small towns. And my test case has always been Reed Springs, Missouri. Reed Springs is <laughs> all about 35 miles south of Springfield on the way to Kimberly Bridge. My parents used to go just about every weekend between Memorial Day uh, when bass season opened and Labor Day when it closed to Kimberly Bridge. There was a fellow came in 1938 from Oklahoma and opened up a float service. And that's my first memories of Reed Springs. <clears throat> in those days, I think Highway 65 was paid, but the turn off at Reed Springs Junction through Reed Springs and on to Kimberly Bridge was gravel and about 25 pretty rough miles. We would always stop in Reed Springs to get ice, and I vividly remember seeing most of the people riding horses or in horse-drawn vehicles as cars. Most of the children were barefoot, and many of the adults also. Now, that's not that long ago. That's why I'm telling you. See, I'm not that old, so this doesn't mean I'm talking 150 years ago. A decade later, when I was in high school, changes were beginning. Most of the horses were gone, the roads were paved a few more miles, and everyone seemed to have shoes. But things were beginning to happen. I'll always remember standing on Kimberly Bridge. Now, that's the one that's 150 foot under the lake now. And watching a friend of mine go up the White River in a 24-foot John boat with a 12 and a half horse wizard motor on. I've never seen an engine that powerful on the water. Now they have 200 horse, which is quite common in those bass boats. I had an old three horse Bendix air cooled. I remember it had an open flywheel on it, and it always seemed to shear a pin as you were trying to go up the wildest part of the shore. And then, boy, you were hang on, man. <clears throat> a decade later, in the late 50s, Table Rock Lake was in, and Reed Springs was beginning to feel pretty important with all the tourists and fishermen passing through. They installed parking meters about two blocks worth to try and get some of those city folks money. 
But when the locals began getting tickets, it almost caused a war, and they were finally taken out. <laughs> but talking about things happening in the Ozark, all this is going to give you a contrast of, of how fast these things have happened. And uh, here we have a relatively isolated area in my lifetime. And then, of course, Springfield kind of got on the mainstream. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a story about Springfield. I always thought it kind of demonstrated this, this new life that was coming in here. In the 60s, one of the restaurants in Springfield brought two brothers over from Hong Kong and not long after they opened their own Chinese restaurant. The place was immediately popular and was packed day and night. You always expected to wait for a table. One evening we were behind some couples that by their speech and their mannerisms, I imagine were from the East, just passing through. And the hostess that night was a girl from down around Nixon, Christian County. I knew her family. Good, hard-working country girl. Well, Ji Leong had hired her and she was uh, the, the hostess that evening. And at that time, somebody had told them they needed to really create an atmosphere. So they dressed all the waitresses up, and she had on a long, full-length uh, robe with all the embroidery on it, and had her hair in uh, pigtails with a little skull cap on, and they even put some makeup. It looked like somebody on Madame Butterfly, you know, the way she was dressed up. And she came up to those people, had her big sleeves and had her arms crossed. <coughs> she bowed, and she said, good evening. How many of you is they? <laughs> And I always, you should have seen that kind of look at each other, those people. I always thought, that's one of my favorite stories. But they didn't quite know what to say. I don't know if they understood her. I really don't know if they understood her. Well, Springfield now has, has about 30 Oriental residents and all the unusual names. The Leongs brought their nephew over, Chong. Chong had House of Chong. Then Chong made money and he bought some, a little chain of local hamburger stands. So we now have Chong's Whataburgers. We had the Walk and Roll. We had the cash you in, cash you out. There's been all sorts there that have come and gone, but we still have about them. Now, they're not Chinese, they're Asiatic, because we have a lot of Vietnamese and Koreans. In that field. Now about tourism, which was the big thing that happened to us. There are three main attractions down in the lakes area. The Shepherd of the Hills Farm, that's what Harold Bell Wright's 1907 novel did as much as anything to focus attention on the Ozarks. Just as Jimmy Driftwood's Battle of New Orleans focused attention on Mountain View 60 years later. But between then and the 1940s, nothing had been done to really promote it. There was just an old mass cabin in the farm. And then a Dr. Trimble, I think from over in Illinois, bought the farm at old mass cabin and began to promote things. And as the tourist business grew, so did the attractions at the farm. Their son sold it about two years ago for millions. And the present owner is going all out to show off the beauty of the Ozark Hills around. He's building a 240 foot high observation building. I don't mean a fire tower. I mean, this is a building. It's going to be however high 240 foot is. It's pretty high. Uh, so people can see the beautiful hills. I always wonder how beautiful that tower is going to look to the people that live on some of those hills around here. <coughs> the next one, caves have always been a major source of interest in the Ozarks. We have more in this, in Green County and Christian and those kind more than anywhere else in the hemisphere, we have more caves. Uh, where was it here? See, I looked up, Kathy. See, I've lost my place. <coughs> Marble Cave, which is just a couple of miles west of, Silver Dollar, of Shepherd of the Hills Farm, has always been one of the most popular. In the 1950s, the Hershen family, from over in east somewhere, a mother and two sons, purchased the property and began Silver Dollar City, an Ozarks village of the 1880s. The third attraction is Table Rock Lake, and I'd place it third in importance, as many thousands of tourists only see it if they have to cross it to get to the Strip, or the motel where they're staying is close to it. Most most of get on the Strip, and that's where they stay, and that's where they spend their money. I'll talk about the Strip later here. Say, last night after I finally got this thing typed, I went down to the soda shop to have a soda. And the little girl down there, we were talking, she was talking about St. Joe, and how it used to be bigger in Springfield, and she said, boy, it's just gotten so big down there. She said, you know, last year we went to the crash fair at Silver Dollar City. And she said, we didn't make reservations. She said, we ended up on some lake or some river or something. She said, I didn't know where. Well, it was at Cameron Bridge. So that brought home this point I was talking about right here. I thought, oh, how, how apropos there. Now, well, let's see. Now, let me give you, let's see, give you some back tonight. Well, that was my lead, in other words. Now I'll talk about tourism and commercialism. I'm going to talk about two subjects. I had four, and you would have been here for an hour and a half, so I kept cutting and kept cutting. Now we're down to two. But they're, they're the two that, due to their popularity with the tourists, have been most affected, and that's wood carving and the music. Baskets were the other one, and quilts, which were pretty good subjects too, but if you just don't have the time. 
wood carving. Now this is the reason I like to give this talk up here and not down there because I got some people down there get pretty upset with this probably. This, of all the traditional Ozarks crafts that are promoted for the tourists today, this one has the least to do with being an old traditional Ozarks craft or folk art of any. Neither I nor my father nor my grandfather nor Doug Mankey or Emmett Adams, those are old timers down there, or Bob Walsh who was conservation down there, agent, or any of the other multitude of lifelong natives of the Ozarks who have spent their lives in that osmosis process I was talking about, ever saw old timers sitting around the square carving these, carving these majestic wood sculptures, the busts and statues of the faces on the tree trunks. What you see for sale now. What we did see were lots of talented whittlers making wooden chains or little cages with a ball or an animal inside, uh, or one of a thousand concoctions always carved from a single piece of wood. That was the criteria of a good carver, was he did these things out of one piece of wood. Let's see. They also carved all sorts of toys. And as Doug Mankey wrote an article just recently in the last issue of the White River Valley Historical <coughs> Society Bulletin about Uncle Johnny Spear, who was a Sunday school teacher, used to carve little abstract pieces in wood that he would teach at, at uh, Bible school. <coughs> now, as far as the figures, the only ones I remember wouldn't interest the high dollar tourists today. They were pretty primitive compared to what's in the shops. Now, collectors of primitive art go wild over them. They usually depicted a horse-drawn wagon with people sitting in it or people doing farm chores or the ones we used to call limber gems or jumping, jumping jacks. That's what you call dancing dolls today. <clears throat> I don't mean that, they, that there weren't absolutely any wood sculptors in the hills. Junior Cobb of Three Brothers Arkansas disproves this, but there sure weren't many. A good book on this subject is Donald Van Horn's Carved in Wood, Folk Sculptor of the Arkansas Ozarks. <clears throat> but with the arrival of a man named Peter Engel, who had been hired by Silver Dollar City in the 60s, things changed with relation to wood carving in this part of the Ozarks. He's an, he's an extremely gifted carver, and he began a school of wood carving that spawned new generations of artists locally and attracted talented people from all over the country. The works of art in wood available now are astounding, and the prices they command are astounding too, some in the thousands of dollars. But between the whittlers and the artists are always the expediters ready to accommodate those less affluent tourists that still have bucks to spend. You'd be amazed what an automated lathe can do. My first introduction to this was when I was nosing around the back of a large wood carving shop a few years ago, and I noticed a door partly open. I looked in, now I, got a, well, I forgot to lead you into this. Some time ago, I was given one of those little sandalwood shoes with a sole that curves up and has a hole in the bottom, and then there's little leather tongs for the shoelaces. But I've always been proud of that. I thought, boy, I can just see some guy sitting there carving that thing, you know. Uh, pretty intricate, you know. Where was it? Well, my first view in that back room was a large barrel about this high, full of blanks for those wooden shoes. And over among the machinery were all, in various stages of completion, were hundreds of other of these shoes. They just turned those things out, mass production, you know, by these lathes and everything. Then they stained them. Two weeks ago, I was at Silver Dollar City, and I knew I was going to give this talk. And I asked every carver where they were from. And though some lived in Branson now, or Branson area, not a one was a native of the Ozarks. They had a big sign on the big banner across the front of this barn they have down there that said National Wood Carvers Association. And that was full of carvers and their expensive wares. In the back were five carvers working on five big wooden Indians. So I guess they really must sell those things. We have, even have artists down there now carving figures with chainsaws. They're quite popular now, a little loud, but... <laughs> But what it all comes down to today is that the region is no longer a center for Ozarks crafts per se, but that the Ozarks have become a center for craftsmen of all sorts, with wood carving being the most prominent. Silver Dollar City now returns to this festival, to their festival, this wood carving festival, as the festival of American crafts. They're a far cry from that Ozarks village of the 1880s. Of course, the tourist doesn't know the difference. So far as they're concerned, these are all old Ozark crafts. At the stained glass blower shed, I've always wanted to talk to one of them and tell them how well I remember that if, if at Grandma's house, if we'd break a gra glass, why well, she'd just trot out to the barn, fire up the old blast furnace, and blow us another one. Well, I think they'd believe it. I really do. <laughs> now let's get to music. <coughs> always in the Ozarks, music has been one of the major forms of entertainment, the principal occasions being the music party, the square dance, or church. Always the fiddle was the main instrument. 
uh, accompaniment, if any, was either another fiddle, the guitar, banjo, mandolin, piano, or piano, as they'd say, cello, or a variety of innovations that could help provide time, like uh, beating the straws or spoons or that type of thing. Everyone participated. Either they played or they danced or they sang. They would work all day, ride miles in the dark to someone's cabin, dance all night, and get back home in time to start the chores. Rackfoot Emmett Adams, who was one of the best jig dancers in the Ozarks, uh, Forsyth tells of dancing all night and then practically falling asleep walking behind the plow the next day. New tunes were transmitted by ear. Only rarely did someone read music, and it wouldn't make any difference. They didn't have any music around anyway. They would hear a new tune, but by the time they got home, would lose half of it or mix it up with another. So there are now an endless variety of tunes in this traditional fiddling in the Ozarks. The closest thing to a tape recorder in those days was a good whistler who could remember tunes. Many a fiddler's wife served this function. I got tape after tape where they were yelling the other room, Shorty, how's that tune going? You'll hear the wife whistle it, and that gets them started. Wow. <clears throat> the first big change came with the Victrola. For the first time, all of them could hear the tune over and over the same way and learn it that way. This also greatly enlarged the repertoires of all the musicians. When radio appeared, it increased the avail availability of new tunes tenfold. Part of our folk culture in this southwest Missouri, northwest Arkansas, and northeast Oklahoma region was Radio KWTO, Keep Watching the Ozarks, which was in Springfield. It was live music from 5 in the morning until I think it went off maybe about 4 or 5 in the afternoon. <clears throat> By the 30s and 40s, the popularity of round dancing had caused a decline in interest in square dancing. And by the 50s, many a fiddler had laid his fiddle aside. A centuries-old tradition was about to be on its way to extinction. In 1958, the four Maid brothers, M-A-B-E, from Humansville, just south of Springfield, who had been performing in the Silver Dollar City and the Shepherd of the Hills Farm, started their own music show, The Ball Knobbers. Now, 30 years later, along the State Highway 76 for about two miles west of Branson, that's what we call The Strip. There are 23 country music shows with a total seating capacity of 40,000 seats. The motels in the area now have more than 4,000 rooms available. <clears throat> this is not counting the big outdoor theater at Swiss Villa, which is located nearby Lampy, Missouri, nor the four other country music shows in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And they're pulling in the big names of country music. This year, I can think of Johnny Cash and Willie Nelson, Randy Travis, Reba McIntyre, and many, many more. Some shows are now owned by country stars, Roy Clark, Boxcar Willie, Ray Price, and Janet Daly, who writes all the pulp novels, owns two of the shows, plus a big investments in condos and land in the area. 20 years ago, I predicted when there were seven or eight that that was the saturation point. They were all going to go broke, a lot I knew. But some didn't fare too well. One musical family who decided to cash in on all this tourist money got so far in debt with their building that they opened one night to eight people and closed the next day. <clears throat> so what will you hear at these shows? With a few exceptions, pretty much the same thing. Whatever the tourist wants, which is usually top 40 country rock that he's been indoctrinated or cloned with, for countless hours on his radio or TV. At most of them, you'll see the sequined outfits, the skin-tight leotards, and the permed, pomp, bleached, or dyed hairdos. They're always the too sweet and too neat for words made on female vocalists, and they're really too stupid to be real clown. <clears throat> Each show averages about 12 performers, and I would guess with stagehands and technicians, there's another six or so. This plus the musicians playing at Silver Dollar City and Shepherd of the Hills and some of the other attractions, you could probably say there's around 500 or so <clears throat> making their living directly off music. I wouldn't venture a guess as to how many, but I know a lot of local musicians are making their, their livelihood now of music, just like the Maid Boys did. <clears throat> now here's the interesting thing that's happened down there. And uh, I don't, if I told this story in New York or it would make any difference, or, or California, but in the Ozarks, it, it really was interesting. Only three shows give much attention to the fiddle. And to each of these, the fiddler is Japanese. There's Soshi Tabuchi at Country Music World, He's a real nice fella. Mike Ito at the Ball Numbers, and a girl that was here for a while who's gone now named Tokyo Matsai. These three all appeared, uh, showed up about the same time. Well, they saw Soshi was popular, so some other shows went out and got these other two in. <clears throat> and the stories were soon circulating that some of the local fiddlers that had been unable to get work were thinking about going to Springfield and having cosmetic surgery. Now, to satisfy the crowd, all any of these fiddlers have to know is, bow them cabbies down, listen to the Mockingbird, Faded Love, you got to do that to satisfy the Texans and the Okies. And above all others, above the national anthem even, you got it. 
Orange Blossom Special. The story I'm going to tell is not at all as far-fetched as it may sound to some of you who haven't been, had the experience. But I want to tell you what happened in Springfield. We went to a benefit, a big semi-formal affair. And for entertainment, they had one of the shows from the Strip who had donated their time come up and present the entertainment. One of the featured entertainers was this Tokyo Matsu. <clears throat> when introduced, she jumped from behind the stage she didn't stay on stage. She was out there. The tables were in kind of a big U, and she performed kind of in the middle of that U. She jumped out from behind the stage in that typical outfit, the satin scene leotards, the high spiked heels. I don't mean high. I mean high, high. I think she was almost walking on her toes. <clears throat> and she had a, her hair was hanging, flowing down below her waist. She had a green sequin fiddle and a bow that was almost as long as she was tall. They had the sound so amplified that her fiddle sounded like a French horn. I wish I'd had a tape recorder to play that for one of my friends that plays a French horn and say, hey, listen to this French horn. Can you do that? And see what they have said about that. She first played Faded Love, and then in an introduction that built up to almost a shout, announced that she was going to play the tune we'd all been waiting for, the Tokyo Orange Blossom Special. Some of the people I knew sitting around us who had some vague idea that I had some connection with country music, they don't really quite know what, looked at me with big smiles and nods as if to say, hey, here we go. And I nodded back, hey boy, man, oh man, I can't wait. Now she didn't leave the station slowly like most of them do. She tore out of there like a cannonball out of a cannon. And you never saw such gyrations and contortions. She was jumping around like someone killing snakes. The audience was reacting in kind, some wildly clapping, others bouncing up and down their seats and some whistling. I was busy wondering how in the world she was keeping that hair out of her bowl. As I sat there listening and thought of the many other times I'd seen this same thing, I envisioned in my mind some ancient shaman tens of thousands of years ago in his deer antler headdress and his beer skin robe sitting around a bonfire beating out Orange Blossom Special on a hollow log while cave men danced wildly around. I really believe there must be something in the melodic structure of this tune that evokes man's most primitive emotions. This tune really is a connection back to our roots way back to our roots. At the end of it all, Tokyo Matsai was exhausted and so was the audience, and that pretty well ended the evening. As what, I, as what I said of her act and the crowd's reaction is just about par for the course on the strip or anywhere else you'll hear that tune. The wilder the better. You'll probably get a standing ovation no matter what you do, but it's what the public expects. They seem to have a fascination with Orange Blossom Special. I've seen, there's one guy that regularly on the strip uh, when he gets to the shuffle part, flops down his back, lays his legs up, and plays the shuffle part behind his legs. Two guys, one got on the other shoulder and called themselves 12 foot of music because <laughs> they were both six foot tall. I don't know, they may have played Bob and Cabbage Dan. I can't remember what they played. <clears throat> so after all this talking, I've done about what the general public seems to want. Is there anything left of what we call traditional music in the Ozarks? Well, yes, more than most of you would ever imagine. Any night of the week, with the exception of possibly Sunday night, I can find a music party somewhere within easy driving distance of my home. Typically, it will include the same components as a century ago, with maybe the addition of a dobro or a, break, or a, back, a bass fiddle. The repertoire, though, is much more varied now, because along with all the traditional hornpipes, reels, jigs, shotishes, and waltzes, there have been added country blues, what I call honky-tonk, different than what you were calling blues. Yes. Now, they would call those colored blues, yes. which you were playing. This, this uh, oh, uh, Florida blues, Delaware County blues, that kind of stuff. That's what we talk. I call them honky tonk blues. Uh, the rags and tin pan alley, <clears throat> gospel, and more modern tunes like Over the Rainbow, Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain, plus a horde of bluegrass style tunes. But I still don't remember ever hearing anyone play Orange Blossom Special with these get togethers. Fiddling is too big a subject to get into now, but it began a comeback in the 60s, and it's now going strong with a new generation. Uh, taking it up, like the Paras, in other words. This generation, and I don't know if this holds true or not, this generation now have to be the most accomplished musicians ever. They play a variety of instruments, all with equal proficiency, uh, have larger repertoires, and know more, more about music than any of the old timers I ever dreamed of knowing, may, might have dreamed of knowing. <clears throat> but remember, they never worked in the fields or chopped wood all day. All day. Some of the fellows I play with have such Callous and gnarled hands, I don't see how they even make a chord on the guitar. But the young people today also have had more free time, the best of instruments, and above all, they've had the tape recorder, which has really made the difference. <clears throat> With these young fiddlers coming on, old time square dancing is coming back. 
which in turn will give the musicians something to play for. I must point out, though, that in many places in the Ozarks, none of this ever did fade. It was kept alive by sm small family units or small neighborhoods. They've always done it. I think the folk revival of the 60s and 70s, and in my part of the hills, that large concentration of music over around the Branson area, uh, and the chance to actually make a living at it, they have had some, some part in this renewed interest in the, in the Ozarks. <laughs> Programs like the Missouri Cultural Heritage's apprenticeship program are doing much to sustain it. So what should we conclude about all these tourists and all this valley who they attract? Lester Dill, who promoted Merrimack Caverns south of Stanton, Missouri, he's the one that brought the man back he said was Jesse James, tried to have his name legalized uh, as being the re Jesse James who never died. And uh, of course they said no, but he got a million bucks worth of publicity out of it. <clears throat> he said that having an inanimate attraction like Shepherd of the Hills, Old Mass Cabin, Silver Dollar City's Marble Cave, it's like having a movie house with only one film to show over and over. So to keep them coming back, you've got to keep creating new attractions. So hence, Silver Dollar City now has a Cajun band in this Ozark village of the 1880s. And Shepherd of the Hills is building that 240-foot tower. If the tourists suddenly expected Tibetan monks working in the black shop, you can bet they'd have them. But that's their business. And so it goes with the whole tourist industry in the Ozarks. Most of us natives have become pretty well, pretty passive about it and accept it for what it's worth. I don't like it. But all, but uh, there's no doubt in my mind that it's a damn sight better than having a steel mill or a strip mine or even an automotive assembly plant. The Ozarks have been changing rapidly the last couple of decades at what seems to be an accelerated pace. And so is what we call Ozarks folklore. There's no doubt going to have to be a reevaluation of what it constitutes. As for my passion to music, how long will it hang on <clears throat> in its traditional form? Oh, I think it will, just about like it has the last 50 years. But time will tell. I just wish it would all held off a couple of more decades. Thank you. I don't know if you could have any questions to that talk at all. <laughs> but pretty much the same with the baskets. Now, uh, if you go down there, the one cr really quality thing you can still buy is a basket. But you'll pay for it. Because what they've done, now we still have basket making families. Uh, fourth and fifth generation. There, there are more of them now because those families begat more families who are doing it. And they're doing it full time because Silver Dollar City and uh, Shepherd of the Hills and all and Eureka Spring, they're, they're contracting for these families complete outputs of, of baskets. But they've also done some shortcutting because there's a big demand, you know, and they've got a big number to meet. And there's a lot of little things they do now that probably their grandfathers would have frowned upon, but they're still good baskets. But you'll pay a basket. We used to go, when we go to the river, we'd stop by these basket makers' places and they'd have them hanging on their fence out in front. And those great big ones like this, we'd pay $2 a buck and a half for it. Now that was big money to those people. They sell for $150, $200 now. The little ones we paid uh, 10, 15 cents for. Yes? Just a comment on the symbolism of the music, because it seems to me that we who are in the Ozarks are very tribal, both as the Scotch Irish influence of tribalism. Native American is one of the things I'm working on right now. We tend, all of the people I grew up with, don't ever go someplace to see the scenery. We go there to visit Aunt Tessie, and on the way we stop in mm -hmm. to see the Grand Canyon. <coughs> all of my relatives go over to see somebody in the area of Branson, and then they just have to spend two weeks going up and down their strip and taking yeah. so dollars. It takes about that long to go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, one trip now to the ride a long number. But that I don't know of anybody who's investigated the mythos, if you will, of the group. Because we're so damn hard to get along with that it takes blood to keep us from killing each other to play together. I think that the idea of that we play as family groups, we're the only th that it's, it's that blood being thicker in water is the only reason we don't break up. And then the audience that comes in for that period of the performance becomes a member of the extended family in the same way that for 30 minutes they are a member of the MASH unit or for an hour they are a member of the Star Trek. But as long as we are hunting families, we got a good thing going for us <coughs> Well, there's still a lot of family. There's family bands have always been around. They don't travel around like they used to. But uh, now I'll tell you another myth about all this that I found in the last 20 years is this stuff about anybody that plays, uh, any fiddlers especially, are drunkards. 
Now there's a lot of drink, there's no doubt about that, and there are some that, that are that way, but the vast majority of them, I've never been to a music party where there was open drinking. Uh, one place I go, have gone for years, all of them are very dear friends of mine, and about three, four years ago, one of them had a bottle out in the car, and they started drinking, and two of them got in an argument, had a big cuss fight, and these are people in their 70s. They didn't meet together now, they split up for two years, and I stayed away too, because in the Ozarks, you're not in between, you're either for one side or you're for the other side. And you don't want to ever get involved in those things because uh, uh, you're going to end what, 50% 50, 50 of what you're doing is going to be wrong. That half will like it and this half won't. So you just stay away from that stuff. But they don't have that much trouble. Uh, you just have to watch where you go is all. Just like you do in town. It's no different than being in that city. But anyway, that ought to be enough. Yes? I was going to say that something that's a little parallel to, to some of these Happen in other parts of, oh, yeah. not I, only the U.S., but also other I need, when I, I should qualify myself. I talk about the Ozarks because that's where I'm from. Yeah, that's well, where I, I live. I, but I know this this holds true many, many places, yeah. Well, one of the things, of course, is that when it comes to real folk music, as real traditional music and the traditional ways of presenting it, there's generally not a lot of money to be made at it. So you don't get promoters. Big time Thank promoters God. in, in to make, make the big <laughs> yeah. money. And but in the other sort of field they I mean the field of pop music and the field of the sort of top folk country hybrid thing, the, there is a chance for them to make big money. And they do it with the same means they do in other parts of pop music. They don't push the music so much as the personality, the mm -hmm. star personality. And that's I, I think that's one of the big differences between traditional approach to music <coughs> and, and the pop See, they've, they've created in us in this country an insatiable appetite for change. Uh, I don't want traditional music, as I, can, as I see it, ever being popular, ever being, in other words, to make money. It, I don't want it to ever make, I've seen them take bluegrass, all of you have. We started out with bluegrass, then we went to newgrass, then we went to progressive grass, and now they're going on and on, and they, and, and, and they'll burn, and they burn it out. And then you have to start all over again. But there's still some people playing old time. Oh, yeah, yeah, but I mean, it, it's still. actually killed it. Yeah. Yes. Let me just point out, however, that we are retaining the same musical structure. We're all still using the same scale, whether we're heavy metal or bluegrass or newgrass or whatever. And uh, rather than looking for fine differences, as opposed to art music, which, after all, has not been tonal for 75 to 100 years, there is a very great similarity between what is done by whether it's Michael Jackson or the Dillards or any bluegrass group, they're all using the same they're, they're all using the same harmonic and melodic materials. Yeah, but I wouldn't tell that to the people I play with. <laughs> I know, but, it, but it, it, we are very much working with a highly amalgamated and conservative tradition. I can think of no area that is using a quarter tone scale. In Sweden, it's, uh, it's very common in some of the film movies. They don't, I mean, not, they don't have a full scale of quarter tones, but it's quite common to play, well, first, they'll have tunes that bob back and forth between the, between the major and the same main one, say between D major and D minor. So, you know, playing either the F or the F sharp, but they'll also play between them. And I remember other places where they do this. And some of that comes from the fact that it comes from old bagpipe. Uh, some of it comes from old bagpipe. It does have a bit of different scale. But also, it is a way of just getting us something that's indefinite, whether it's major or minor. That makes so called neutral theory, which does. Yeah. yeah, but now the people I'm talking about don't know what you're even talking about, and I'm kind of lost too. But the thing is, some of them only know two chords, and this music is dance music. It was never meant for you all to sit out there and for me to play a tune up here. And you just bang away and you get a fiddler. If you, uh, they used to be, if they had a fiddler who knew one tune, that's good enough for the square dancers. Because they aren't listening to what you're playing anyway. They're listening to the boot, and a beat, I mean, and they'll go on and on and on and on. You just have to quit. Uh, we, one time we used to go down to a place at Ozark and play. It's where I met Art. And one old boy only knew C chord. Now it didn't make any difference whether you were an A or what. He played in C. You ought to hear some of those tapes I have. That's the <laughs> most awfulest thing you ever heard. And they, we had this roll, roll, roll your boat effect where 
Some of them didn't quite know all the chords, so they'd watch this guy over here, and they'd see you make this, then you'd see them do this. Well, I'm not, this is not an exaggeration. Over here's another guy watching him. So you had everybody one chord behind. And about the fourth one caught up, you know, but it's just a roar. But they have a good time, see, and that's the whole thing about it. And uh, you talk about argument. There's one old boy we knew used to talk about. He didn't know all them. Aug what he, instead, augmented, he'd say argumentative. He'd never heard of them argumentative chords. But uh, a couple of times I tried to show one of them a minor or something, and, you know, that you don't do that. That, that depends. They don't want to learn those anyway. They've been doing it for 70 years the other way. Thank you. Can get hold of them. Okay, they are moving on down the river. Ballad of the Boom Slide. Reflections on the Carter family on a day like today. Okay. I didn't mean to make a sales pitch. <laughs> I know I did. Of course, you won't find it. Um, actually, I'm glad that I'm doing this talk. It's keying in with some of these other things that people have been talking about, both with Don's paper to some extent, um, especially where Max Hunter is concerned, and also with Gordon's in a lot of cases. It's a hard act to follow, by the way. That was a uh, wonderful thing. You got water. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it sounds like the situation that's going on in Branson is a case of maybe revivalism of a sort going bananas and commercialism just taking over um, to ridiculous extremes. And, um, and I'm going to be talking about the urban folk revival. I'm not talking about current folk revival trends. Um, I think that was because I didn't have my topic at the time when this was made up, so they went ahead and just put something. Actually, I'm going to be talking about the contributions made by the urban folk revival. And first, I want to say also that I'm, I'm very glad that Tom Paley's here. I'm sure he's going to have many observations on this subject. Um, I'm flattered that he's here. Um, certainly, being a, a former member of the New Lost City Ramblers and a very wonderful revival musician. He's influenced untold numbers of musicians all over the country. The New Lost City Ramblers, as I'll talk about in this paper, have made a great deal of contribution to folk song scholarship in very many ways. Myself, I'm presenting this in some ways because this paper really is a result of a dilemma I've had in my mind for months and months and months now. As a matter of fact, at the end of this paper, I'm just going to pose a number of questions. Um, I don't have definitive answers. I'm not going to present that at all. What I would like is a discussion and have you all provide some, some answers as you see them um, and see what you come up with. Anyway, I, I guess you could call both Dave and myself as being somewhat children of the folk revival in some respects. Even though we've learned some songs traditionally, when I came to Missouri, I met people like Taylor McBain and started learning songs from, from fiddlers around here, including Taylor. But when I was very, very young, about, I guess it's five, six, seven years old, I was taught to play guitar by my older sister, and she taught me a lot of folk music. Now, it happens to be a lot of those songs were folk revival songs. I didn't know that then. I was singing Frog Went a Court and, and Autumn to May, which is a Peter, Paul, and Mary song. I had no idea where the songs came from, didn't care. But those are the kind of songs I was singing. I like a lot of those songs, and if I have children, I'll pass those on. I think you're beginning to have a situation where you might have some traditions operating on their own within the folk revival. I think that's beginning to happen because the folk revival, for one, has been around for such a long time at this point. It's old enough now to start having traditions of its own. Anyway, I call this Beyond Tom Dooley, the contribution of the early folk revival. <coughs> and again, like Gordon, I'm going to read it, but I'll try to look up and interject some comments as it goes. may be bizarre. <coughs> Although the urban folk revival, or arrival, as some have chosen to call it, is now matured, much confusion and misunderstanding still surrounds any realistic discussion of this subject, not only among the general public, but among folklorists themselves. Although the revival has undergone many dramatic changes since the 1930s, when left-wing city folk singers tended to look at traditional song primarily as a vehicle of social protest, and you think in minds in terms of the almanac singers and people like that, 
It is surprising how much suspicion is still directed at all revivalists for manipulating traditional material for their own purposes rather than respecting it for what it is. Now we've heard this, these are comments I'm not making up, I've heard this myself when we've gone out into the field. You know, let people say, you know, that you're not respecters of the old timers' traditions, you change it. I've heard that said many times. Um, although it's been years since the commercial folk craze of the 50s and 60s that spawned such media attuned, uniformly dressed groups as you know the names, the Kingston Trio, the Brothers Four, it's disturbing how frequently revivalists are assessed as little more than entertainers with no consideration for their traditional sources and with only the objective of pleasing an audience in their minds. Although it cannot be denied that the revival did and still possesses some negative aspects, granted there are those people who are trying to make a commercial living and are trying to become stars, that does happen. It's the purpose of this paper to examine the other side of the coin, namely that of the contribution of the movement not only to segments of the urban population, but also to the field of folklore itself. A brief look will also be taken at the end, and this is where the questions come in, at how the folk revival has begun to just influence traditional artists. I'm not going to say it's good, bad, but I'm just going to point out that it is happening. Numerous articles and books, such as R. Sergei Denisov's Great Day Coming, explore the interrelationships between left-wing politics and the infant urban folk revival. Although it would be erroneous to downplay these interrelationships, because it's a very important part of what was happening, of course, it's an unfortunate thing that this one aspect of the revival appears to be emphasized at the exclusion of any other. For from the beginning of the movement, there was more than just political ideology spurring the interests of city folk and traditional music. Um, a person who I will keep nameless, who's in the country music field, certainly a bona fide traditional artist, works with revivalists on many occasions, but when you mention just the word revivalist by itself, an instant feeling of they're communists, comes to this person's mind. I think a number of people in the, in the country music industry still see it that way. Things have changed. The revival has undergone many, many changes, but still that image has persisted, unfortunately. Even in the 1930s, when the connection between the folk revivalist and even the Communist Party of America was getting so much media attention, few singers ever actually joined the party at all, and some had no political affiliation whatsoever. I'm going to use the example of Burl Ives. And I know he's come under a lot of criticism among the, the folk revivalists for various reasons. But he was also, he was praised by the communist press as an artist, a real singer of the people, but he was never more than marginally involved in this leftist movement. He in fact rejected it because to him, he liked the music itself more than just the political ideology the songs conveyed. Um, he said in his book that maybe a lot of you had when you were younger, the Burl Ives Songbook, he said, folk <coughs> songs became my repertoire. I did not sing them because they were folk, didn't know what the term was, because I thought them musically beautiful and their content meaningful, dramatically, lyrically, or humorously, expressive of a genuine human value. And that was the main reason why I chose to learn these songs. Coming from a musical family with an interest in traditional songs and ballads, Ives began singing pieces such as Barbara Allen. Actually, at the age of four, he knew Barbara Allen was singing 15 verses to the song because he liked the stories these songs told. Also noted musicians Charles and Ruth Crawford Seeger passed on their love and respect for traditional music to their children, three of whom, of course, became well-known revivalist <coughs> performers, Peggy, Pete, and Mike. According to Ruth Crawford Seeger in her American Folk Songs for Children, one of the most significant values of folk songs is not their politics, but what it tells us about ourselves and our history. <clears throat> it's a quote from her. This music has been a natural part of work, play, sleep, fun, ridicule, love, and death. It's grown out of and passed through many ways of living and doing. Facts and fantasies cling to it from its wandering. It knows and tells what people have thought about the ways of living and the things that happen. Through it can grow an intimate appreciation of the railroads it helped build, the cotton it helped pick, the ships it helped sail, the land stretches it made less lonely. This music bears many finger marks. It's been handled roughly and gently. It's been used. And that was the reason why they... <coughs> from the beginning of the revival movement, then, there were a number of participants who enjoyed song and music for more reasons than simply for political messages. For many of the revival, this type of music answered some desire for a need for roots and provided a means of obtaining relief from, this is a quote from Bill Malone in Country Music USA, the anxieties of a highly complex and industrialized urban society restless and ever clinging and beset by nuclear fears. According to composer Eli Siegmeister, 
The need for roots was largely felt during the New Deal and then World War II, two events that seemed to draw diverse elements of the population together, at least temporarily, in a common bond. The need to feel a part of America's cultural tradition, to feel like new branches on an old tree, was particularly strong at this time. And even after World War II, the need for establishing some kind of roots did not disappear. On the contrary, folklorist and former revival singer Ellen Steckert indicates that for many, many city musicians, American folk song and music represented a kind of replacement of former traditions that had gradually become lost in the city environment. And this is a quote from her. People in the cities are people who originally came from different traditional backgrounds. They came to the city and then lost their traditions and are now reviving a tradition, whether it's their old one or not. And that's true in the case, I guess, of, of Dave. He's Polish. He comes from a Polish family, both sides of his family. He's now playing Southern music. Um, at that time, when he was learning uh, songs and tunes, the Polish traditions in the family had sort of been eradicated, because at that point in time, there was an emphasis on trying to keep, to be American, and to emphasize the American part of your culture, not to emphasize the Polish things. So a lot of that's been lost. He speaks no Polish. Now he wishes he did know those things. But that was not taught to him by his parents. So now he's playing Southern Mountain music and enjoying that. True American. <laughs> <laughs> John Cohen, banjo player and guitarist for the New York City Ramblers, one of the most successful of all the revivalist groups, agrees with the statement by Steckert. It's a quote from him. The revivalists are developing some strong feelings about their music. The music they follow holds for them feelings now and sounds that have become almost the same as their own. While provi besides providing the city musician with a sense of roots, the songs and tunes of the folk revival seem to offer something simple and yet substantial and concrete in a restless, industrialized society. Pete Seeger, for example, appreciated the frankness and honesty of folk song at an early age. To him, these songs possessed more of the meat of human life than many art and popular songs. Some people have said some of the folk revival was a reaction against Tin Pan Alley and the emptiness of that kind of music. I found a quote that seems to fit with this. This is from a book that uh, I gave Dave some years ago called the Folk, folk Music Source Book, which seems I guess in large part interested in the revival, it also mentions a lot of traditional music sources too. But quote at the beginning of this book, we live in a world filled with the noise of machinery. Our apartments truly keep us apart. They're filled with expensive phonographs and tape recorders and we use them to create walls of sound to shut out the noise of the machinery and of our neighbors as they build their own walls of sound. Our traditional music is a rural music that exists at peace with a quieter and more spacious environment. In Burl Hammond's fiddle playing, you can hear the sounds he's heard in his life. Birds, a creek, the mountain wind coming down across a standing timber. All you have to do is listen. And it's some a bit idealistic that that's some of the motivation for the times. <coughs> anyway, although Bill Malone in Country Music USA indicates that folk song may have served some in the revival as not a whole lot more than escape mechanisms, such as Western movies or television for some musicians, certainly others were not so intended interested in unrealistic escape as they were in simply discovering the centuries-old art of making music and banjo playing and fiddling and singing largely recreational activities that provided temporary relief from urban pressures. The contributions of the revival, however, extend far beyond the various feelings it provided to those actually involved in the movement. I use movement loosely. In several significant ways, the discipline of folklore, and in particular the field of folk song scholarship, has richly benefited from the revival and is still feeling the results of this movement today. Although to some individuals, and I could ask here, um, the word revivalist conjures up almost instant images in your mind. You say it and some people that we've talked about in the field think of Joan Baez. They think of somebody with long hair, that's a typical revivalist holding a guitar and singing um, some form of protest song. There's no image in your mind of somebody who's actually trying to get an understanding of traditional music and what it means. Um, <coughs> anyway, uh, see, I've lost my place too. <laughs> Although to some individuals the word revivalist conjures up instant images of Kingston trios or of Judy Collins, it's important to note that not all performers in the revival were or are primarily concerned with making themselves commercially popular. Some have been genuinely concerned with collecting traditional music out in the field or by locating it on old commercial 78s and presenting it in as accurate a way as possible giving full credit to their sources. 
a string band that we've come into contact with called the Indian Creek Delta Boys of Charleston, Illinois, constitute one such group of revivalists. Even though they have very militant feelings, when you call them revivalists, they get angry. They said, we learn these songs and tunes from our parents and grandparents, so we're traditional artists. But in many ways, they've also been considered revivalists by other folks. Their recordings consist of fiddle tunes and occasionally songs that they've collected and learned from fiddlers all over southern and central Illinois. Notes to the record always include information about where each tune was learned, who it was learned from, and brief backgrounds about the pieces, including any history that they might know and the keys that the tunes are in for anybody that might be interested in learning to play the tune. Now, the model for the Indian Creek Delta Boys, I would say, could be found in the popular, highly influential string band that emerged in 1958, the New York City Ramblers, consisting of John Cohen, Pete Seeger's half-brother Mike, Tom Paley, and later Tracy Schwartz, who replaced Paley. The importance of this band in the history of the folk revival cannot be overestimated. For not only did they help generate a huge interest in old-time string band music and bluegrass music all over the country, and you certainly can see many, many string bands who take the Ozark Folk Center as an example, they even have string band contests, string band jamborees. They're just coming out of your ears at this point now. But they did a significant amount of uh, very substantial field collection work, produced several influential recordings of old-time musicians for folkways records, and actually brought traditional musicians from the South to the northern urban audiences, providing some city audiences with their first hearing of the real thing. To some revivalists, such as Sandy Payton, who owns Folk Legacy Records in Sharon, Connecticut, this opportunity of hearing traditional artists signaled the real beginning of the folk, of the folk arrival, as he calls it. He does not feel like the time period of the Kingston Trio was truly the revival in a lot of ways. He thought that was a commercial type of movement more than anything else. Well, the folklorist would be hard pressed to find fault with the field research done by the Ramblers. Seeger and also Ralph Rinsler, formerly a member of the Greenbrier Boys, did much of the initial collecting which would eventually lead to the national acceptance of bluegrass as a legitimate field of study, a valid musical genre. John Cohen went into the mountains of Kentucky and North Carolina, maybe some of you have seen the record, but uh, Mountain Music of Kentucky, now considered kind of classic, and later produced not only three long playing records consisting of various selections from his field tapes, but a film on traditional artist Roscoe Holcomb, which has been shown as part of the basic folklore class at Indiana University. Bill Malone writes in Country Music USA that, quote, Mike Seeger and such groups as the New Lost City Ramblers and the Greenbrier Boys provided an immense service by broadening the concept of folk music. They've contributed to the increased national recognition and scholarly respectability according to country music. Actually, that's a significant point. Folklorists were, actually took them quite a long time to come to grips with how they felt about country music. I think it was not until 1948 that you had an issue in the Journal of American Folklore that dealt with country music at all. I think it was seen as a commercial music and somehow should be left alone. But now, it's certainly considered a legitimate field of study on folklore. In fact, such groups as the Ramblers did even more for country music. They caused many country performers to take a look at their own heritage at a time when the burgeoning Nashville music mill was rushing madly away from its past in an effort to cater to mainstream popular taste. Bill Malone credits a revival with helping to also create an interest in Nashville and story songs with folkish type of themes. Some of those you may question, maybe they weren't so good. Some, however, have been truly accepted by the folk and sung. One is a case of a song, Danny Dill's Detroit City. And that has been documented as having gone into tradition. Being sung meant a whole lot to the transplanted Southerners who came from places like Kentucky to work up in, in Detroit and places like that very, very homesick for their southern environment, and yet knowing they could not go back. Songs like that were sung by people like this. They really enjoyed it. Also, Merle Haggard's Mama Tribe, even Jimmy Driftwood's Battle of New Orleans. Now, that could start a whole other controversy here. When you talk about Arkansas, this could get real hairy, so <laughs> let it go to later. Also, it's interesting, in our European trips, these songs have been embraced with unbelievable fervor, songs like Detroit City. People love those songs. I don't know exactly what it means to them, but they're singing in a great way. Though it might be argued that the Ramblers were <coughs> the typical members of the urban folk revival, I maintain there were a significant number of hardworking individuals like them who contributed a great deal to folk song scholarship. Sandy Payton of Folk Legacy Records records, tends to record only revivalists now, but in his earlier fieldwork ventures, 
He collected from a number of fine traditional singers, including Edna Ritchie of Viper, Kentucky, the sister of one of the sisters, one, one of the sisters of Jean Ritchie, Frank Prophet of Reese, North Carolina, Joseph Abel Trivet of Butler, Tennessee, and even Max Hunter of Springfield, Missouri. Chris Strockwitz of Arhuli Records has also made some significant field recordings of blues artists, such as Texan Madison Lipscomb. Recordings by the Deseret Spring Band, another one of my favorite spring bands, contain songs and tunes obtained in field collecting ventures throughout the state of Utah. Yeah. Two minutes, okay. Maybe same Perhaps the most significant contribution, I'm going to make this point, of the folk revival, however, is that it opened the nation's eyes to the beauty and simplicity of traditional music in a way that few folklorists, folklorists by their efforts alone, were able to do. Although the national interest in folk music was not destined to remain at such a peak level, it would never entirely disappear. Even today, folk festivals across the country are still popular events to attend. Observing the staggering number of guitarists, fiddlers, banjo pickers, and dulcimer players at a festival that also Dave and I attended in California, Mike Seeger commented that the college campus Kingston Trio type revival was but a commercial event to him, the real folk revival is now. Also from the academic folklorist's point of view, one of the greatest achievements of the folk revival is that it spurred so many young people, including myself, to take a serious look at traditional music and culture, even as the Kingston Trio happened to be singing things like the Merry Menuet to packed college audiences across the country. And these individuals tended to look into ballad collections, to listen to traditional artists, and have a great deal of appreciation of working with traditional artists. Although not all these people remained so sincerely interested through the years, a sizable number did, and maintained the appreciation enough to even pursue folklore as a genuine interest. Many went into folklore as a field of study. D.K. Wilgus, professor of English and Anglo-American folk song at the University of California, comments favorably on this trend. He says, the most promising element of this revival lies in the number of students who've come via the revival to serious work in folk song. They're learning to accept and use academic tradition of American folk song scholarship. Among these individuals, I'll mention a few, are Ellen Stecker, state-appointed folklorist for Minnesota, Bert Feintuff, who is my, one of my teachers at uh, the Center for Intercultural and Folk Studies at Western Kentucky University, Joe Hickerson, now the head of the Archive of Folk Song at the Library of Congress, Dylan Dustin, newly appointed state folklorist for Massachusetts, even Howard Marshall from the Missouri Cultural Heritage Center, um, Bess Lomax Hawes. All these people were former revivalists and have come into work with folklore. Anyway, maybe I should stop there. So I've got a lot more to say, <laughs> but I better stop there. What, what I was briefly going to talk, and maybe we'll sum it up, is that I'm beginning to notice cases where the revival has begun to influence repertoire of traditional artists. I've gone through and listened to some of Max Hunter's collection, and you get things like Ollie Gilbert, who sang wonderful ballads, wonderful broadsides, uh, a great many camp meeting songs, which has always been of interest to me. She also sang the last thing on my mind. Um, she also sang, Please Don't Squeeze My Charmin, and tunes like that, and to her, they were all good songs. In fact, I've heard, and this is an interesting thing, that she really liked folklorists coming around collecting tunes from her. So when she found that her own traditional repertoire was beginning to get a little dry, well, she found other sources. She just kept wanting folklorists to come and kept Grand trying to sing songs. Grand 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 yeah, exactly. Annie Riddle armed herself with her tape recorder. Sure. Almeida Riddle, who was one of the yeah. finest traditional singers ever to come from the Ozarks. Now, this is a case that Max Hunter brings up, and that's why I wanted to talk about this. It's like, very interesting. Um, Max said he collected from her a wonderful version of a song called The Maid of Dundee, and he thought it was one of the prides of his collection. And he asked Almeida where she got the song, and she said it was a combination of three or four versions, some of which she had gotten at Urban Folk Festival. Max Hunter went, cried over it, and erased the song. Now, Max is sorry that he did that. At this point, he says now he wishes he had recorded it, as you pointed out, the total repertoire. And from my point of view, I'm interested in how even commercial music have had an influence on traditional singers. Therefore, I would maintain that it's good to record the total repertoire, including the folk revival songs, not to pretend they didn't exist. Um, Anyway, that's one case in point. I've also noticed a record that recently came out by Will McNeil, fine record of a traditional family, the Williams family. It's called the All in the Family. Um, they sing a lot at the Folk Center. They're from the Little Rock area. Their latest record has noticeable folk revival influences in it. In fact, I went back. I've got a sizable record collection at home 
um, I went through my records and found out one of the songs on the record, The Young Man Who Wouldn't Hoe Corn, which is in fact a traditional song sung in the Ozark, was verbatim, word for word, melody line precisely the same as Gene, uh, a song found on one of Gene Ritchie's records. There was not even one word difference. Now, I maintain that if it wasn't gotten from a record, then what happened to the traditional, you know, there's usually differences when something goes through tradition, and there was none at all. And there was also a song on the record called Cruel Willie. Now, Bill McNeil said, listening to the song, he said, it sounds like there might be some revival influence. And indeed there was, Bill didn't know, but that was actually, um, the Williams family said they couldn't remember the, the name of the family they learned the song from, but Actually, it turns out to be Dudley and Deanie Murphy, revivalists. Mm -hmm. And the song was uh, Cruel Really, written by a man named Bill Caswell from the Tulsa, Oklahoma area. So their mystery of that is not truly a revival song. It has begun to influence the repertoire. For better or for worse, I'll leave it up to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure. sorry. We have Everyone today is on Lance Gordon, Canada, Happy Hour.